thank you for coming. And uh, we're going to go on a little musical journey with Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace and Thomas Huxley. And uh, you might wonder what qualifies me to tell you the story about these Victorian scientists and, uh, and in fact, what qualified me to write the book, Darwin's Universe. Well, I was trained as an anthropologist. Uh, as a matter of fact, you might say I am the very model of a modern anthropologist. I am the very model of a modern anthropologist, a linguist, a geneticist, and quite a good ethnologist. Know the tomes of Fraser, Malinowski, and of Radcliffe Brown, from Andaman to Trobriand, and all those niches up and down. Indeed, when I know what to do to exorcise an evil eye, when I can sing a Hopi chant or shout a Cheyenne raving cry, in fact, when I can slash and burn a tract of jungle to the ground, you'll say a better anthropologist has never yet been found. <laughs> I can tell a shanty metal waves from castings made in Dahomey. I know the skulls from Swartcrans and the crania from Oldaway. I understand the structure of a North Australian kinship group. I know the proper etiquette for courtship in a monkey troop. Then I can list the primate groups with reference to phylogeny and tell you how a runter plan to marry off their progeny. I'll tell you all the details of a Slavic peasant's wedding gown and read the Krakayudal text as well as Boaz wrote them down. In short, when I can isolate the presence of a sickle gene, when I can reconstruct the fragments of Australopithecine, when I can tell you all about mid-Pleistocene ecology, you'll say, you met a man who really knows his anthropology. I have excavated pyramids, druidic tombs, and palaces. I'll break down any language with constituent analysis. I have a smattering of botany and ethnomusicology. I'm up on tribal law and economic anthropology. In fact, when I know what is meant by cargo cult and cooler ring, when I could fix a Nazca pot or tie an Inca quipu string, a chimpanzee consigned to me, sociobiology, he knows he's met a man who really knows his anthropology. Well, let's try it in double time. In fact, when I know what is meant by cargo cult and cooler ring, when I could fix a Nazca pot or tie an Inca quipu string, a chimpanzee consigned to me, it's sociobiology, he knows he's met a man who really knows his anthropology. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about Mr. Darwin. And um, the image that I had when I was a lad of Darwin was this sort of aloof, intellectual, distant figure. This is a statue that we don't see very much in this country. It's in the Moscow State Darwin Museum. And here he's depicted around 1920 or so as a, almost a Michelangelo God kind of figure, uh, also a socialist hero, um, not very accessible. In, in the last few years with the anniversaries and so on, we've gotten a lot more familiar and maybe a bit more irreverent towards uh, Darwin. In fact, some of the students in his own hometown of Shrewsbury uh, placed a traffic cone on his statue and made him into the wizard of Shrewsbury. <laughs> and I have also seen him in the New York subways opposite uh, Curious George. <laughs> but now, who was the real guy? Let's, let's get to know 
the real Charles Darwin. Darwin's the name. I was born a naturalist, but my father, Dr. Robert Waring Darwin, a prosperous English physician, did not consider that a marketable aptitude. When I was a boy, he said to me, you care for nothing but bird shooting and rat catching and will bring disgrace upon the entire family. And he said, you've got to get a proper occupation, Charles. You, you can't be a, an idle squire, a Kentish hog, you know. I loved collecting beetles and birds' nests and fossils. That was my passion. Father said, enough of that childish stuff. You're going to be a doctor. He sent me off to Edinburgh Medical School at 16 years of age. Well... <laughs> I, I was bored with the endless lectures on Materia Medica. You had to mix your own pills and potions. I much preferred going by the seashore with one of the teachers who, who was an invertebrate zoologist named Grant. And uh, we'd go to this place with a wonderful name, a Scottish bay, called the Firth of Forth. And there at the Firth of Forth, I discovered starfish and jellyfish and and uh, anemones. And um, I really wouldn't do well in medical school because, first of all, I hated the sight of blood. And I remember one time, uh, you know, the way they operated on people in those days before the invention of blessed anesthesia and chloroform was they would just strap you down and cut off whatever they were going to cut off shove something in your mouth so you couldn't scream. And I saw that done to a young child in the operating theater. It sickened me so deeply that I ran out of that operating theater, never to return, and so ended my medical career. Well, my father said, well, <clears throat> if you can't be a doctor, uh, let's see if we can make a clergyman out of you. That would be very respectable. You could... You could be a country vicar. You could uh, go to the best lawn parties. And uh, you could, you could uh, save souls and collect beetles at the same time. I thought that sounded reasonable. So off I went to Christ College, Cambridge, to study theology. I was a rather indifferent theology student, and I spent most of my time with one of the reverend gentlemen named Henslow, um, hunting for beetles and, uh, and other natural history specimens whenever I got a chance. But all of that changed one day when I got a letter. There was a captain named Fitzroy who was about to take a five-year voyage of discovery around the world on HMS Beagle. And he was looking for an unofficial ship's naturalist. And Henslow recommended me. Oh, my, I wanted to go so badly <sighs> to leave England's dull gray skies for the tropics, the beautiful bright skies, the tropical birds and flowers. My mind was in a tropical glow. My father said, you'll never come back alive. And he had his point. Many young, adventurous young men went out from England and never returned alive. Oh, but I wanted it so badly, and finally my father relented and let me follow my heart. And so there I was on the Beagle. Um, he hired an assistant to help me pack specimens. I was seasick every single day for the entire five years. 